Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Monday, April 8th, 2024. The solar eclipse moves across the United States, inspiring awe in millions of people in the path of totality from Texas to Maine. President Joe Biden travels to Madison, Wisconsin to announce a new plan to provide student loan debt relief. Donald Trump in a video says abortion policy should be left up to each individual state. The Senate is back in session today from a two-week recess. The House returns Tuesday. Some of the items on the agenda, impeachment articles against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, aid to Ukraine, and reauthorization of the Wireless Wiretap Authority for non-U.S. citizens outside the U.S., known as Section 702 of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Israel withdraws much of its military forces from Gaza, but the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in a video says a date has been set for entry into Rafah and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there. We'll get Biden administration reaction. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen in China after days of meetings with government officials says the U.S. will not accept another flood of cheap imports and that China is subsidizing some industries like EVs that could hurt U.S. manufacturers. Plus a preview of the Japanese Prime Minister's official visit to the U.S. from the U.S. Ambassador to Japan and the Japanese Ambassador to the United States. Over 40 million people across North America, from parts of Mexico through 15 U.S. states and then to eastern Canada, got to experience today's total solar eclipse, the moon fully blocking out the sun, complete darkness. And virtually everyone else on the continent experienced a partial eclipse. Cleveland was in the path of totality, and Senator Sherrod Brown, Democrat from Ohio, was joined there by NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. I'm Sherrod Brown. It's uh, great to uh, welcome Bill Nelson, former astronaut, former senator, now runs NASA. Uh, Welcome him to Cleveland. Ohio's an aerospace state. Uh, The Glenn Research Center, Armstrong down the road in Sandusky. And it's just the perfect place uh, for Administrator Nelson to be here as we as we observe and celebrate this eclipse. So, Administrator Nelson, thank you for joining us. And what a celebration. It's become a big festive occasion. People are really excited about what's happening up there in the cosmos. Central to that is what the Glenn Research Center does, named after John Glenn, and the Armstrong Center named after Neil Armstrong, both located here in Ohio. They paved the way for us to understand now as we sail on this cosmic sea to far off cosmic shores. And that started right here in Ohio. You said four days to the moon, seven months to Mars. It's that much further away. And that's why we're gonna speed it up going to Mars with new propulsion technology that's being developed right here at the John Glenn NASA Research Center. The NASA Administrator Bill Nelson joining Senator Sherrod Brown in Cleveland. NASA TV provided all-day coverage of the eclipse as it moved across the U.S. Here was the moment of total darkness in Russellville, Arkansas. Crowds getting excited. The crowd, yeah, all around is completely electric. Going, going, wow, oh my goodness, here we are, here we go, and, and the crowd goes wild, God. oh my, wow, we got some Bailey's beads, oh, absolutely, Stunning. That is spectacular. We see Venus over to the over to the side there. And Patrick, it came and went so quickly, but we did see a diamond ring we did at indeed. the very beginning there. Can you describe to us what is that? Sure. That that diamond ring effect is due to the, the moon not being perfectly smooth. It's got mountains, it's got valleys. So just like here on Earth when we see a sunrise or a sunset through a valley, we just watched a sunset uh, 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 through a valley on the moon. Absolutely stunning. Oh my. So you said we could see one planet. I see it right there in the yep. sky. Can we see <laughs> any others as we're looking up? Yeah, we've got Venus on the, on the over to one side. We've got Jupiter up here uh, to the left of the sun. And there's this the corona. Absolutely beautiful. 
NASA TV coverage of the solar eclipse in Russellville, Arkansas. They had people stationed in many of the cities and states along the path of totality. In Washington, D.C., a lot of senators and House members on Capitol Hill posting photos of their eclipse viewing. It wasn't a total eclipse, but a partial eclipse. Senator Mark Warner, Democrat from Virginia, with pictures of himself and about a dozen other senators, all with eclipse glasses on looking up. And he writes, the first and final meeting of the committee on the eclipse. NASA and many research institutions conducted scientific experiments to coincide with the solar eclipse. The U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, putting out a video about the potential social benefits. The sun is a universal source of light and life. It contributes to our physical, mental, and emotional well-being, and it unites all of us. Today, no matter where you're watching from, whether it's along the path of totality or a partial solar eclipse, you are sharing the experience with millions across the nation. And moments of connectedness like this truly matter. Last year, I issued a Surgeon General's advisory warning about the public health crisis posed by loneliness and isolation. I shared that our connection with one another is a powerful force that can help protect against the damaging physical and mental health impacts of loneliness. What better reason is there to come together with friends and loved ones than to share a once in a generation experience like the solar eclipse. This is an experience that will stay with you precisely because of the awe that it inspires. Awe allows us to step outside of ourselves, giving us fresh perspective and opening us up to connections. So grab your eclipse glasses and let's enjoy this moment together. Dr. Vivek Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General in a video. The economic and financial Analysis firm Perryman Group, based in Texas, estimates that the economic impact of the solar eclipse to local economies from tourists and and locals spending on hotels and Airbnbs, food, gas, other entertainment, $1.6 billion. And rather than throw away your protective glasses after this one use, a group called Astronomers Without Borders will collect them and give them to people in future paths of totality around the world so they can view eclipses safely, especially in countries with populations that can't afford to buy new glasses. This is Washington Today. From NBC News, President Joe Biden on Monday announced revised plans to cancel student debt that, along with other actions, would benefit millions. During a visit to Madison, Wisconsin, Biden's new plans are aimed at canceling runaway interest for millions of borrowers, nullifying debt for those who are eligible for but not yet participating in certain forgiveness programs, such as those in public service who've been paying off their loans for 10 years or more, borrowers of undergraduate or graduate loans who started paying off loans at least 20 or 25 years ago, respectively, borrowers enrolled in low financial value programs and those experiencing hardships that prevent them from making loan payments. The new plans are the administration's latest efforts to provide relief to borrowers of student loans after the Supreme Court struck down Biden's original plan to cancel up to $20,000 in debt for about 43 million eligible borrowers. Biden acknowledged the high court's ruling and the opposition from Republicans in his remarks Monday, saying that forces administration to find alternative paths to reduce student debt. That was from NBC News. President Biden spoke at a technical college in Madison, Wisconsin. Today, I'm proud to announce five major actions to continue to relieve student debt for more than 30 million Americans since this, I started my administration. First, my administration will propose a new rule to cancel up to $20,000 in runaway interest for any borrower that owes more now owes more now than when they started paying the loan. That's a big difference. And for low- and middle-class families enrolled in my SAVE program, we'll cancel all of your interest, all of your interest. And second, we plan to cancel student debt for borrowers who still owe student loans, even though they started repaying them more than two decades ago. Folks, third, we plan to cancel debt for about 2 million borrowers who would be eligible for debt forgiveness through the SAVE program, public service loan forgiveness, or other debt canceling programs, but are not enrolled in these programs. Some of you are only finding out after the fact, as you're a teacher, a firefighter, a cop, that you qualify, but you just didn't know about it before. And now people are, but you're eligible no matter how long it's been, you've been out of the program. Fourth, 
We plan to cancel debt for borrowers who the Department of Education determines were cheated by universities that left students on unaffordable loans and delivered little in benefits to students. And you know, you know one of those, you know one of those colleges was closed. I won't mention it. And finally, the Department of Education will propose a new rule to cancel student debt for Americans facing financial hardships, from child care to health care, to prevent them from paying back their loans. And over the coming months, the Department of Education will propose and then implement these plans. And starting this fall, we plan to deliver up to $20,000 in interest relief to over 20 million borrowers and full forgiveness for millions more. President Joe Biden in Madison, Wisconsin today. Associated Press article on his visit reads the trip comes less than a week after primary voting in Wisconsin, a critical battleground, highlighted political weaknesses for Biden as he prepares for a general election rematch with Donald Trump, his Republican predecessor. Reacting to his announcement on student loan debt relief, Senator Tom Cotton, Republican of Arkansas, posting on X. Once again, President Biden is ignoring the Supreme Court and shamelessly raiding the Treasury to transfer billions in student loan debt to taxpayers. He's using your money to buy votes. And Senator Eric Schmidt, Republican of Missouri, who led the successful legal challenge to the president's original student loan debt relief program when he was Missouri Attorney General, posting, he's at it again in a cynical effort to buy votes. It's a huge middle finger to those who paid them back or worked their way through college or took an entirely different path. He's shedding younger voters, and he knows he's losing to Trump. He and the Dems are desperate, and it won't work. That post from Senator Eric Schmidt. From Fox News, former President Trump announced on Monday his position on whether abortion should be banned following months of not taking a stance on the combustible and crucial issue in this 2024 rematch with President Biden. The presumptive Republican presidential nominee took to his social media platform on Sunday night to say that he would issue a statement on abortion and abortion rights. In a video posted hours later on early Monday morning, Donald Trump explicitly affirmed his support for in vitro fertilization, and he emphasized his support for states determining their own laws for abortion, so long as there are exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. That was from Fox News. Here is a portion of the video. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. It must be remembered that the Democrats are the radical ones on this position because they support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is, the baby is born, the baby is executed after birth, is unacceptable, and almost everyone agrees with that. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or, in many cases, your religion or your faith. Do what's right for your family and do what's right for yourself. Do what's right for your children. Do what's right for our country and vote. So important to vote. At the end of the day, it's all about will of the people. That's where we are right now, and that's what we want, the will of the people. Part of the video with Republican presidential candidate and former President Donald Trump posted today on his social media platform. Some Republican lawmakers and conservative organizations posting responses opposed to the position Donald Trump is taking. This from Senator Lindsey Graham. Republican of South Carolina on X, I respectfully disagree with President Trump's statement that abortion is a state's rights issue. Dobbs does not require that conclusion legally, and the pro-life movement has always been about the well-being of the unborn child, not geography. The White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre was asked for a reaction at her news conference on Air Force One. 
on Trump and abortion. I know the campaign put something out, but just on the policy position that he's taking, any response? Um, so, obviously, don't want to comment on 2024 election, going to be really mindful, but I have a couple things that I want to say here. So, the only reason that that extreme abortion bans are now in effect all over the country is because of the judges the previous president and Senate Republicans put in the courts. The only reason that women are being denied life-saving and even unrelated procedures and turned away from emergency rooms as a result of those bans is because of the judges the previous president and Senate Republicans put in the courts. The only reason that Republican officials are able to take radical actions like banning IVF and criminalizing doctors for providing care is because of the judges the previous president and Senate Republicans put in the court. When it comes to the fundamental freedoms at stake, and the devastating health care effects that Republican officials' extreme agenda mean for more and more American women every day, we need to be clear-eyed here. Just look at the extreme law about to go into effect in Florida as one in three women live in states with bans. With bans. Just look at the budget. Look at the budget. 80% of House Republicans put out that bans abortion with no exceptions for rape or incest. The president is absolutely clear. His administration, the Biden-Harris administration, has been very clear. We need to restore the protections of Roe, and that's what we're going to continue to fight for. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre answering reporters' questions on Air Force One. President Biden with a statement with all his empty words on fertility treatments. Trump doesn't tell you the MAGA Republicans he controls in Congress have put forward bills that could ban fertility treatments. And the Speaker of the House he empowered is one of the strongest supporters for a national abortion ban in the nation. Let there be no illusion if Donald Trump is elected and the MAGA Republicans in Congress put a national abortion ban on the resolute desk, Trump will sign it into law. That was the statement from President Biden. Congresswoman Nancy Mace, Republican of South Carolina, posting, We support President Trump's statement today. We believe wholeheartedly in protecting IVF, protecting exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother, and today abortion is left to the states. That is the law of the land. ABC News, after voting in February to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, impeachment proceedings will head to the next stage on Wednesday, when the articles of impeachment are expected to be transmitted to the Senate. One thing is clear, this is not going to look like the impeachments we've seen in the last few years, since a full-scale trial on the Senate floor is not likely, according to senators and leadership aides, despite what many House Republicans want. That was from ABC News. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, on the Senate floor today, filed a few preliminary resolutions. The Majority Leader. I understand there are three joint resolutions at the desk due for a second reading on block. The clerk will read the title of the joint resolution for the second time on block. SJ Res 67, joint resolution to provide for related procedures concerning the articles of impeachment against Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security. SJ Res 68, joint resolution providing for the issuance of a summons providing for the appointment of a committee to receive and to report evidence and establishing related procedures concerning the articles of impeachment against Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas. SJ Res 69, joint resolution to provide for related procedures concerning the articles of impeachment against Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security. Madam President, in order to place the joint resolutions on the calendar under the provisions of Rule 14, I would object to further proceeding on block. Objection having been heard, the joint resolution will be placed on the calendar. Senator Tammy Duckworth, Democrat from Illinois, presiding in the Senate and the motions made by the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. C-SPAN spoke to Politico's congressional reporter Anthony Adragna about what to expect with the impeachment articles against the Homeland Security Secretary this week. How do we know about how this is going to play out and the timeline for this in the Senate this week? Right. So remember, the House a uh, couple months ago actually went ahead and uh, voted to approve these articles of impeachment. We're expecting them now to be delivered to the Senate on Wednesday. And I think the real thing to watch is then whether uh, Senate Democrats led by Chuck Schumer make an immediate motion to try to basically do away with the trial. They can do that on a simple majority vote. And there have been a number of the more conservative members of the, Dem- the Democratic caucus 
including some who are up for re-election this year, who've all expressed openness to that idea. So I think this could be a relatively swift process. We'll see if that's how it plays out on the floor. Is, uh, are there any Democrats who want to see a trial go through? Do Democrats have the votes at the moment to, to do that? I, I think at this point, we think they probably have the votes to do away with this. And I, I'd watch even some of the moderate Republicans who've uh, basically said, you know, this, this is a policy disagreement with Secretary Mayorkas, but the case has not been made for why he's made, uh, why he's committed impeachable offenses. So I think we, you know, we could be seeing uh, even some Republicans peel off as well. So this isn't uh, even a matter of seeing, uh, hearing the arguments from the impeachment managers that the House has sent over. We won't even see that part if this happens. If, if things go as we expect them to, I think we, we may not actually get to that stage. Uh, certainly Republicans have made the argument very forcefully that they'd like to see a full trial conducted. The House impeachment managers have also called for a full trial. But there doesn't seem to be much appetite among Senate Democrats to really see this play out in a lengthy uh, occupation of the floor. What is uh, Mitch McConnell said about this? Mitch McConnell would like to see a, a trial, but I think, you know, as we would expect with him, he's been fairly practical um, and acknowledged that Democrats are likely to try to do away with this swiftly. Anthony Adragna reports on Congress for Politico, joining C-SPAN on the morning program, Washington Journal. Senator Roger Marshall, Republican from Kansas, was on Fox Business Channel this morning, urging enough Senate Democrats to join the Senate Republicans to vote for that full trial of the impeachment articles against the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The Republicans have accused him of failure to enforce the country's immigration laws, obviously, but Mayorkas is criticizing Governor Abbott in Texas over the use of the razor wire to keep migrants out. He's claiming that the wire is not effective because illegal migrants are easily cutting it, Senator. This is his answer to this. Well, certainly the, the world knows, the country knows that Joe Biden, Secretary Mayorkas own this problem. I think the challenge before the Republican senators this week is to make sure that we, we prove once again how Joe Biden owns this. We hope that the good people of Montana, of Ohio, of Pennsylvania, of Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, we hope that they're watching and they realize it would take just two senators to force an impeachment trial. Right now, Chuck Schumer is going to try to table this for the first time in Senate history we're not going to have a trial after articles of impeachment have delivered. But we need to make sure that everyone votes 200 days from now and make sure that they fire Joe Biden along with Secretary Mayorkas. So is, is it clear to say then this is just an exercise to check a box? You're going to send the articles of impeachment. You know he's not going to get impeached. Well, I think that we don't have, it's going to take two thirds of the Senate to impeach people, to impeach anybody. Uh, so we don't have that two thirds, no, but, but our job is to communicate to every person, especially in those purple swing states, that their senator didn't even allow us to have a trial. We think if there was a trial, even if we lose the impeachment vote, that that would bring attention to American voters and ensure that Joe, that Joe Biden is fired come November, along with bringing us a Senate majority and a House majority, that the Republican Party is the party of law and order we are the party that will secure the border. Senator Roger Marshall, Republican from Kansas, on the Fox Business Channel this morning. The Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is scheduled to testify on Wednesday before the House Appropriations Committee about his department's fiscal year 2025 budget request the same day as the House Republican majority will be delivering the articles of impeachment against him to the Senate. Anthony Adragna, reporter for Politico, writes at Politico.com about the agenda in the House and Senate this week. Under foreign aid, watch Speaker Mike Johnson this week for any indication of how he plans to proceed on a foreign aid package aimed at helping Ukraine and Israel as he's floated innovations to garner more GOP support for the legislation. And under surveillance authority, over in the House, the chamber intends to move legislation to reauthorize a controversial surveillance authority known as Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The House Rules Committee intends to meet on Tuesday to consider the pending bill. The House is back from its recess tomorrow. Today in the Senate, the Majority Leader Chuck Schumer spoke about both of these issues. Congress has until April 19th to pass an extension of FISA's national security authorities. That is the next major deadline we face on the calendar. Preventing FISA from lapsing will take bipartisan cooperation and swift action. The House is currently working on the best path forward on FISA, and the Senate stands ready to jump into action to prevent this important national security authority from lapsing. We must get FISA done this work period. As the Congress gavels back into session, I also urge Speaker Johnson and House Republicans to snap out of their paralysis and pass the Senate's national security supplemental. The situation in Ukraine is desperate. 
Speaker Johnson has now sat on his hands for 55 days as the National Security Supplemental has collected dust in the House. That's 55 days of America standing on the sidelines while our friends in Ukraine fight and die on the battlefield with no support. 55 days of our European allies wondering when the U.S. will step up. And with each passing day, Ukraine continues to run out of more ammo, continues to run out of soldiers, and continues to run out of hope that can successfully expel the Russians from their borders. And let's be blunt, the biggest reason Ukraine is losing the war is because the hard right in the Congress has paralyzed the United States from acting. That's it. That's the reason. Speaker Johnson has to decide for himself whether or not he will do the right thing for Ukraine, for America, and for democracy, or if he'll allow MAGA Republicans to hand Vladimir Putin a large victory. I'm confident that if the Speaker puts the Senate's national security supplemental on the floor, it will pass. It remains the best, quickest, and most realistic way to get Ukraine the help it needs. So again, there is a lot that the Senate must do in the coming weeks and months, and to get anything done will require bipartisan cooperation. I thank my colleagues for their good work so far in 2024 and look forward to working with all of them to keep delivering for the American people. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, on the Senate floor. House plans to vote on the Section 702 reauthorization bill on Wednesday. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there. I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. On the war between Israel and Hamas, some updates from the Washington Post. Some residents are returning to the ravaged city of Khan Yunus after Israel withdrew all but one brigade from southern Gaza. Military officials said that troops are being rested for future missions and the conflict is far from stopping. A new round of ceasefire negotiations began this week in Cairo. And while Israel's key objective remained first the and foremost the release of hostages, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said in recorded remarks Monday. It remains set on total victory over Hamas, which would require entering Rafah, the southern city where much of the displaced Gazan population is sheltering, and eliminating the terrorist battalions there. That from the Washington Post. The White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby was asked about the developments during an online audio news conference. I was wondering if you could just kind of give a a general reaction to the Israeli statements over the week, and then we're we're positive on ceasefire negotiations and, and possibly pulling some troops out of Gaza. Are you, you know, are you encouraged by those? Are you still kind of wait and see um, just whatever you have on that? And then I know you said you didn't have an update on the talks themselves, but I was wondering if you had a response to the, if you could share if there was a response to the letters the president sent to the leaders of Egypt and Qatar on the hostage talks. And, and if there was a response to anything you could share there. So as we said before, um, the announcements and the statements coming out of the Israeli government over the last uh, two, three days um, are are welcome. And we are, as I said in my opening statement, beginning to see them move on some of the very specific things, the concrete steps that the president asked them to do. Uh, And so, uh, again, these are welcome steps. These are welcome announcements. These are welcome statements. Uh, But really what it comes down to is, is sustainability. Um, and a commitment to meet these com- these these uh, to commitment to follow through on these steps over time. Uh, I don't have a response to speak to uh, in terms of the president's communications with uh, 
the Emir of Qatar and with the President Sisi of Egypt, um, that those uh, those letters were 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 sent to convey the president's strong view that we we want them to urge Hamas to uh, to commit to this hostage deal and to abide by those commitments. And as I said, um, the, a proposal was offered, and we're gonna we're gonna wait and see what uh, Hamas's response is. Um, and I honestly think that anything more that I would say, even though you're not really asking about the hostage negotiations, you're asking about the letters. Anything more I would say at this point, uh, you know, could potentially put that response in some kind of jeopardy. And, and I just don't want to do that now when so many lives are hanging in the balance. White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby on an online audio only news conference. He also said the Biden administration is pleased that more than 300 aid trucks entered Gaza on Sunday. But the White House would continue to press Israel to allow more humanitarian aid in Short time after John Kirby's news conference, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu posting a video message on X in Hebrew, the English translation reading, Today I received a detailed report on the talks in Cairo. We are constantly working to achieve our goals. First and foremost, the release of all our hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas. The victory requires entry into Rafah and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there. It will happen. There is a date. And at the State Department briefing with spokesperson Matthew Miller in Washington, he was asked about that. The prime minister just said, like in the last hour or so, that a date for the Rafah invasion has been set. Um, Have the Israelis shared that date with the U.S.? To my knowledge, we have not been briefed on that date. And given what the Israelis have briefed U.S. officials on uh, to date in terms of their plans for, you know, the operation, um, I assume that what you've seen thus far Uh, would not be something that the U.S. would approve? So we have not yet seen them present a credible plan for dealing with the 1.4 million uh, civilians who are in Rafah, some of whom have have moved more than once, some of whom have moved more than twice. But even more than that, we have made clear to Israel that we think a full-scale military invasion of Rafah would have an enormously harmful effect on those civilians and that it would ultimately hurt Israel's security. So it's not just a question of Israel presenting uh, a plan to us. We have made clear to them that we think that there is a better way to achieve what is a legitimate goal, which is to uh, degrade and dismantle and defeat the Hamas battalions that still remain in Rafah. So I think, as as you obviously know, we had a conversation with them about it last week. Secretary Blinken participated in that conversation with uh, leaders from the White House and other agencies of the United States government. There will be further conversations over the coming days, coming weeks, uh, where we can continue to lay out our uh, our beliefs about this potential operation and how they could achieve it in a better way. And we'll go from there. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller at his news conference in Washington. Story from Reuters, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned China on Monday that Washington will not accept new industries being decimated by Chinese imports. As she wrapped up four days of meetings to press her case for Beijing to rein in excess industrial capacity, Yellen told a press conference that U.S. President Joe Biden would not allow a repeat of the China shock of the early 2000s when a flood of Chinese imports destroyed about two million American manufacturing jobs. China is increasingly growing its influence and power in the green energy industry, leaving U.S. and European officials worried about being flooded by the country's subsidized exports. That was the story from Reuters. Secretary Yellen held her news conference in Beijing. We're seeing an increase in business investment in a number of new industries targeted by the PRC's industrial policy, and that includes electric vehicles, lithium-ion batteries, and solar. China is now simply too large for the rest of the world to absorb this enormous capacity. Actions taken by the PRC today can shift world prices. And when the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. And we've seen this story before. Over a decade ago, massive PRC government support led to below-cost Chinese steel that flooded the global market and decimated industries across the world and in the United States. I've made clear 
that President Biden and I will not accept that reality again. I know that these serious concerns are shared by our allies and partners from advanced economies to emerging markets. China's excess capacity is built up over a significant amount of time, and our concerns will not be resolved in a week or a month. But the exchanges that we announced during this trip will provide a dedicated structure for us to raise our concerns about China's imbalances and overcapacity among a wide range of other topics in a detailed and targeted manner. We intend to underscore the need for a shift in policy by China during these talks, building on the over two hours I spent on this topic with the Vice Premier last week. This is part of our effort to advocate for American industries and prevent the significant economic disruptions we've seen in the past. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen at a news conference in Beijing, China, after her four days of meetings with Chinese government officials. In an interview with CNBC, she was asked about the possibility of the U.S. imposing tariffs on Chinese goods. She said, I wouldn't rule out anything at this point. We need to keep everything on the table. We want to work with the Chinese to see if we can find a solution. Prime Minister of Japan, Fumio Kishida, is arriving in Washington, D.C. tonight to begin his official visit to the U.S. It will include meetings with President Biden, a joint news conference with him, and a state dinner at the White House, and an address to a joint meeting of Congress. Today in Washington, the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, joined the Japanese Ambassador to the U.S. For a preview, first, Ambassador Emanuel. So I would start um, kind of my, I think, at the White House or the general view of the administration is that you have uh, both countries under major, major change in the last two years. And so it kind of signifies that one, a closing of one era and the beginning uh, of writing the first chapters of the next era. Japan, on their account, has had in the last two years five different 70-year-old or multi-decade policies that have all changed, manifested by the defense budget going from 1% to 2%, counter-strike capability, lifting the cap on defense technology exports, not only normalizing but stabilizing the relationship with the ROK. Then you have, on the U.S. side of the ledger, a significant change of theory, strategy, from a hub-and-spoke to a lattice system. And I think, in fact, this week we're sitting here in the South China Sea. You have the United States, Philippines, Japan, and Australian uh, obviously navies and uh, operations, doing a kind of a practice. And then at the end of the state visit, in the break, you have the first ever leaders trilateral meeting between the United States, Japan, and the Philippines. I don't think that's kind of like a bookend with the state visit in, uh, in the middle. That tells you a lot about how the U.S. approach has changed. And then when you kind of project forward, um, from the administration standpoint, as you said, we've had the Australian, are okay. You've had uh, the Indian uh, leaders and now uh, the Japanese leaders. Four of the five state visits have all come from the Indo-Pacific area. And the constant, though, for the United States in this lattice strategic architecture is Japan. And while we've talked about defense and everything else, I do want to say one thing that's very valuable for the relationship. If you look at any of the public uh, surveys in the region, ASEAN countries, etc., Japan's standing is the highest of any nation. That's a huge amount of political goodwill and capital that comes to the alliance as we're working the diplomatic front, the development front, let alone the collective deterrence front in the region. And so I do think that our efforts here in this state visit is really kind of comes at not only a critical juncture in the area, but also in, uh, if you look at it from a historical context, it's writing the first chapter of the future. Rahm Emanuel, U.S. Ambassador to Japan, today in Washington, D.C., at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, a preview of the Japanese Prime Minister's visit to Washington this week. Sitting beside him, Japan's ambassador to the U.S., Shigeo Yamada. Ambassador Emanuel talked about Japanese reputation in Southeast Asia. 
I was very much uh, encouraged to see a recent opinion poll conducted by Gallup in this country earlier this month, no, earlier this year. There, uh, people from 50 states and DC were asked whether they have favorable views of a country or unfavorable view of that country. The country which came at the top of the favorable view was, of course, Japan. <laughs> that was you know. not a trick question. <laughs> and also, the country which came at the bottom of the unfavorable view is again Japan. So there's a strong sense of sort of a support and affinity uh, with Japan by uh, the people in this country. And I hope uh, the Prime Minister's visit will be a celebration of this strong uh, global partnership which is supported by not only the uh, trust relationship between the two leaders, but also the strong trust between our two peoples. But in addition to just celebrating the today's partnership, the uh, two leaders will also talk about uh, the, that the two countries are indispensable partners to each other in strengthening our competitiveness toward the future. The two uh, leaders will talk about the cooperation in such areas as space, energy, and emerging technologies like AI, quantum computing, fusion, 5G. And the, I, I, I am uh, personally very much excited about the space cooperation, and I know Ambassador Emmanuel is even more excited. And Japan is the foremost partner in the Artemis uh, program for lunar exploration. And we are building a pressurized lunar rover, which will move around on the lunar surface. And the two leaders will uh, talk about the progress we are making in this uh, part uh, or on, the, on, on this issue. So I, I am very much excited about the Prime Minister's visit, which will celebrate this strong global partnership between our two countries. The Japanese ambassador to the United States, Shigeo Yamada, sitting beside Rahm Emanuel, the U.S. ambassador to Japan today in Washington at CSIS, Center for Strategic and International Studies. ABC News reports that when President Biden hosts the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida at the White House for an official visit Wednesday, a senior administration official tells ABC News the two countries will make historic announcements that will take the U.S.-Japan alliance to new heights. The official said the leaders will unveil more than 70 programs and initiatives. On Wall Street today, the Dow down 11, Nasdaq up 5, S&P down 1. Senator Tim Scott, Republican of South Carolina, posting on X, congratulations to the undefeated USC Gamecocks women's basketball team. Y'all are the best of the best and make our state so proud. USC beat the Iowa Hawkeyes on Sunday for the NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Championship, March Madness. Senator Joni Ernst, Republican of Iowa, posting today, great season, Iowa. You made us proud. And the White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, told reporters on Air Force One that President Biden called the winning coach. Last night, the president, as you all know, called Coach Dawn Staley from the University of South Carolina to congratulate her and the team on their undefeated season and national championship. Yesterday's game was fantastic and capped off a women's tournament that generated record ratings. On behalf of the White House, we congratulate the University of South Carolina and all the athletes who accomplished so much for their teams and their and their sport. It was really a March Madness to remember. The White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, on Air Force One. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and get the stories making headlines in Washington emailed to you every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. <music>